Coming up on the show, with rage in our hearts, we proclaim a self-hosted Google Photos replacement and the only way to conceivably self-host your own email. With a caveat. I'm Chris. And I'm Alex. And this is Self-Hosted. I've been looking at buying my wife a Nintendo Switch. Now, I know that you've got one. But I can't find them in stock anywhere, and I'm trying to decide between the Switch Lite and the Switch, like, full version. Talk me through these options. This is perpetually the problem with Nintendo. I I can't believe they still are having stock issues. I know they sell very well, but I I always wonder if this is, like, part of Nintendo's marketing strategy to intentionally always leave high demand. Um, So, yeah, we own a few Switches in the family because... um, you know, sometimes it's more fun when you have multiple switches. It really comes down to this. If she's going to have it docked most of the time, I don't think it matters. If she's going to carry it around and use it and actually play on the screen, the light looks kind of nice. I don't have the light. I have the regular sized one because I wanted to be able to install Linux on it. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> so You can do that? Um, so I think you can with the older ones. I So there was a hardware fix that Nintendo had to issue, so I bought right before the, the hardware fix made it out. <laughs> you know, like I was watching the news and this hardware vulnerability was discovered and I knew it would be a matter of months and so I ordered one and then uh, surely like that that week almost they had, had announced that a new uh, re- revised model. <laughs> so how's, how's that going? Is, is, is it your portable Linux system your go-to? <laughs> oh, yeah, all the time. No, never even tried because the games are great. <laughs> You're so funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, turns out. So I, I say whichever one you can get your hands on, you're going to be happy with. You may try eBay, man. Maybe I'm sure somebody's got it on eBay. Yeah, there's a lot of scalpers, though. I don't want to pay above retail. Maybe a listener has a used one they'd sell you for a good price. Sure. <laughs> get in touch at Ironic Badger on Twitter. Yeah, or you can hit the contact page or something. I want to mention that this episode is brought to you by the all-new Cloud Guru, the leader in learning for cloud Linux and other modern tech skills. You can get hundreds of courses, thousands of hands-on labs. You can get certified, get hired, and get learning. You just have to go to a cloudguru.com. Well, Alex, we have several cool topics to talk about. Cool. I, I'm dating myself there when I say that, but we have some some cool topics, Alex. Um, we thought maybe we'd discuss two big areas of self-hosting for the home um, and photos being one of them, especially with uh, the news about Google Photos, which we'll get, in, get into later, and audiobooks, which you and I are both pretty passionate about. And there's a couple of different options, a couple of different self-hosted solutions you can throw at these problems. And it kind of, I think, maybe is best to start with, like, the awkward elephant in the room that we just kind of have to address. Getting hold of the audiobooks. Now, one of the goals of this show was to showcase all the things you can do with self-hosting and avoid piracy. Obviously, that's a, a hot topic, and it's it's not something that I really condone or anything like that. But, you know, for me, I think audiobooks are straddling a fine line because let's say we're using audible and i certainly think that's what you and i both are using you pay for credits every month i think they're about 10 bucks or 15 bucks a month for a credit that credit allows you to buy in their terminology buy a book except for the fact that that book is locked into the amazon audible ecosystem until the end of time and we've actually had this happen that uh Audible have decided to remove a book from our account because the the publisher has changed uh, the terms of the agreement or something. And, you know, this is fairly common and pervasive amongst streaming providers with licensing deals changing all the time and stuff like that. So this isn't, you know, it's not a new problem. But uh, one of the things I really like to do is download the book from Audible that I've purchased and strip the DRM from it, and then I own it forever. And um, I've been an Audible customer for, I think, 13 years. It was something like that. It's been a long time. I still have an active subscription. And about once a quarter, I just download my latest purchased books, and I store them offline myself. And I use a tool called Open Audible to do that. Open Audible is a $12 shareware product, and um, it requires that you have an Audible sign-in, a valid Audible account that you log in, you sync your library down, and then it will identify each of the books. It'll pull down the information about the title, the description, album art, and if that's what you call it on a book, cover art, I suppose. And then it it begins the CPU intensive process of removing the DRM and saving you a playable audio book that you can use in anything that that plays back essentially M4As or MP3s. 
I use another option, and this is a Windows option called Inaudible. And this one lets you divide things up into, you know, separate files per chapter, as well as embedding cover art and stuff like that, uh, removing the, this is audible, you know, intro uh, and, and that kind of thing. It's pretty nice. Um, I don't know where I got it from. I think a friend on Discord somewhere a few years ago, but it works pretty <laughs> well. That's like the modern version of In an Alley <laughs> from a shady dude with a van. <laughs> yeah, it is. But, uh, you know, laws will differ based on where you live as to the, as to the legality of doing this. And I think there's there is um, other outlets besides Audible where you can get audiobooks. In fact, I have a, a batch from Cory Doctorow that I just bought directly from him. So there's multiple ways, of course, to get audiobooks. So once you have these audiobooks, you have to be able to play them back. And playing back an audiobook is it's a special beast. It's not like playing back music. You want to be able to play back and resume your position. You maybe want something that supports chapters. Perhaps you'd even like something that has a sleep timer if you have some books you go to sleep with, like I do. I like all of these features to be built in uh, to my to my audiobook player, and I've managed to get that to some degree of success. I'm curious what you've employed in this area for playing your own self-hosted audiobooks. Well, the primary consumer of audiobooks in this house is my wife. She is a vociferous reader, and that extends to listening to books as well, because obviously you can listen to audiobooks whilst you're doing the washing up or, or anything else, you know. Uh, and she uh, has been using now for several years BookSonic. So I, I host a BookSonic server uh, out of a Docker container, and this is based around the old subsonic code base. But there have been some tweaks, as you say, you know, to provide support for remembering last playback position, also supporting the chapters and that kind of thing, and and the offline caching aspect of audiobooks, which is which is really important, particularly on mobile devices. So my wife is a, a Google Fi subscriber, so every gigabyte she uses when she's out and about, she has to pay for. So it makes a lot of sense for her to cache an entire book at once, listen to the book. And then no matter what Wi-Fi network she's on when she's driving or, or anything like that, there's no data cost associated with that. So there are BookSonic apps available for Android and iOS. They're a little bit basic in terms of the UI, but their functionality is, is top-notch and very reliable. And uh, being based on Subsonic, there is a web UI to the container as well, which you just access in a browser, and you can play your books back that way as well. That sounds like a winner, BookSonic, right there. Um, I'd say a, a low-hanging but not ideal approach might be to integrate it into Plex if you already have something like Plex set up. I don't like it a lot. It doesn't have a sleep timer for one thing. There's other issues along with playback, uh, but it does does remember the position. <laughs> and it is nice to have all of my books displayed up on the TV. I do enjoy that. I voted for audiobook support in Plex as a Plex Pass subscriber the best part of a decade ago on their forums, and it's just gone nowhere. There are some threads uh, on Reddit, which I'll, if I can find them, I'll, I'll put them in the show notes. But there are threads of people that have gone to a lot of effort to shoehorn audiobook support uh, into Plex, which includes stuff like a metadata agent. The nuances come in when you want to start marking chapters as played. Now, that sounds a really simple thing, but the way Plex marks things as played is once you get over a certain percentage, I think it's like 90 or 95%, it marks the episode or track as played, which if you are you know, watching a TV show and you just turn it off before the credits are done or a movie, you know, that 5% is, is within the margin of error where most of the time it, that just works. Uh, so you've, you've got a few different ways to slice up an audiobook. You, you can have one monolithic file that could be 20, 30 hours long, or the chapters could be a few minutes long. And so that margin of error suddenly goes from being, you know, on a, on a multi-hour file from being a, a big margin to being, you know, 30 seconds, which if you pause your, your playback within that percentage, Plex will mark that chapter as played and you'll miss that percentage of that chapter and it'll take you straight to the next one. So it's not perfect. Nope, not so much. Um, you can you can do it, you can get by, but uh, I don't think either one of us really recommend it. But staying on the topic of mobile just for a moment, on the iOS side, I really like and recommend Book Player. 
It plays most audiobook formats and MP3 audiobooks, obviously. It's an iOS app that has multiple ways to import the audio files into the app. It has some basic functionality like you'd expect, like changing the playback speed, sleep timer. But then it has some quality of life features, too, that I like. It has volume boost. It has smart rewind. And it has CarPlay support. And I really appreciate that. It's just called Book Player, one word on iOS. And something else that I think is really great about it is it is GPL3. So it's open source. It's on GitHub. And um, I think that's just nice to see on the iOS platform as well. Book Player, one word. And um, geez, it's got a pretty pretty good 4.8 4. rating. I hadn't really uh, t- paid attention until I was looking at it for the show. But that's pretty good. Almost a five-star rating for an app is pretty rare. Book player, if you're on iOS, check that one out. I'm looking at another one, and this one does plug into Plex, and it's called Prologue. Oh, yeah. Which advertises itself, and this is iOS only, unfortunately, for me being an Android kitty. This one advertises itself as the ultimate audiobook player for Plex on uh, on iOS. So a couple of options. Yeah, and I have this one. Um, I actually haven't used it very much because I kind of just cooled on the old uh, using Plex for audiobooks approach anyways. But I I think, uh, you know, maybe after the show, I'll give Prologue a, another shot because I actually have the app already installed. <laughs> <laughs> Just hadn't really given it a shot yet. But it looks really good. The UI is pretty tight. Um, and it claims, and this is why I got it, Alex, is it claims to solve that playback percentage issue that you were talking about. Yeah, that's good It's if it solves that problem. That is the biggest problem with Plex and uh, an audiobook playback. But... What about on the Linux desktop? Is there anything there? I like Cozy. I'll link to the Flathub uh, installer if you want to give it a try. It's a minimal, modern-looking audiobook player, so go in with expectations set to minimal. (laughs) But it does the basics, right? It listens to your DRM-free books. It has a sleep timer. It has playback controls for each book, so you can set them per book. I like that. And uh, it, oh, it also allows you to do multiple storage location support. That's kind of nice. I have had scenarios where I've needed that before. And, you know, I like this offline mode. So you can just store something on internal storage. This, I think, will also be a good mobile app for like the future convergence where you have uh, posh driven Pine 64 mobile devices. I think this may actually end up being a, a mobile audiobook player in the future as well. I'm sure those three people that do that will be really happy. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and then, yeah. And then their audiobook player will work on their desktop and their phone because it's the same one. (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry to those three people if I've upset you. Linode.com slash SSH. Go there to get a $100 60 day credit towards a new account at Linode. And you support your boys here at the self hosted podcast. Linode is our cloud hosting provider. We spin infrastructure up to test on the show, but it also runs the back end cloud infrastructure of Jupyter Broadcasting. And all my personal stuff is on Linode. I started using them just over two years ago. And when it was time to take Jupyter Broadcasting independent, I said, let's build it on Linode. And it's been fantastic. And, you know, one of the things I love about them is they're independently owned. They were founded on a love for Linux and open source technologies. Back then, it was user mode Linux. But, of course, they've evolved their system over the years to take advantage of the latest virtualization and container technologies in Linux. They give you full backend access to your Linodes when you spin something up. I used that recently to actually re-image the OS drive of one of my Linux Linodes using their official how-to guide. And they have the tools that make all of that possible. I love that kind of stuff. On top of the virtual servers, though, they have object storage. Now, if you're thinking about building yourself a super fast static website, maybe for a resume, for yourself, for family, for the holidays, check out their object storage. I use their S3 compatible object storage to host the clips that I play on shows. So we will integrate the clips right into our show notes because our show notes are all written in Markdown. I can embed audio files in line that actually are hosted on Linode's object storage. You can use that for website assets. You could even use it as a quick CDN for your for your project's um, distribution. I mean, think about it. There's a lot you can do with S3 compatible object storage when you're not paying Amazon's prices. Linode costs 30 to 50% less than major cloud providers like AWS. So there's a lot of advantage to going over to Linode. Plus, when you go to linode.com slash SSH, you get that $100 credit. <laughs> and you also support the show. I mean, it's like a win-win. So check them out. 
Linode is dedicated to offering the best virtualized cloud computing. If it runs on Linux, it runs on Linode. And there's a lot you can do with that. You know, you know, just go check it out. And then tell me what you do. I've been asking people to tweet me at Chris LAS, or you can hit me up on the Telegram. What are you doing with your Linode once you spin it up? Linode.com slash SSH. Thanks to everybody who supports the show and supports our sponsor by going to Linode.com slash SSH. Time for some feedback. Don't forget you can send in yours at selfhosted.show slash contact. Our first one comes from Jeff. Yeah, friend of the show, Jeff. He writes in, he says, I have an Ubuntu machine serving dual purposes as my home server and HTPC. Uh, this is a Chris side note. This seems to be a really super common setup. And if you think about it, if you really only have budget or space or whatever for one computer, why not make it like a Kodi playback or a Plex playback machine and a server? Or he lives in California where electricity isn't cheap. <laughs> yeah, although he does mess around with some solar, so he might be able to figure that out. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he goes on to say, I'm running the NextCloud Snap in the background with Plasma 5 as my TV front end. Since Ubuntu's app completely breaks on me every time I use <laughs> use Ubuntu seriously. <laughs> <laughs> is I'm looking to rebase my system on something else. I would like to move to NextCloud to a containerized setup, but I failed to properly even set up the most basic Docker images in the past. My biggest hurdle is understanding the database stuff and how they can connect. Not being able to just navigate file structure and see the files, well, it breaks my brain. And plus I'm using the NextCloud snap, I'm going to have issues moving the files out of the of the database buried in the snap itself. <laughs> well, by default, NextCloud does use SQL Lite for data storage, so that's kind of built into the container. You can also link a database of MySQL as well, so maybe that's what you're thinking of. I I wonder if it's only him and a couple of family members like he says here in the email, does he need to have a more robust database? I appreciate there's a performance difference, but there's also the simplicity. I mean, it must be what the snap is using already. Now that I think about it, yeah, it must be. And and to be honest with you, this is uh, this is one of my issues with Snaps as a whole on the server, right? I appreciate that Snap install Nextcloud is very easy, but it's also, dare I say, it, I don't want to sound like gatekeeper here, but it, it, it's almost too easy. But couldn't you make that argument for Docker? Well, uh, maybe, maybe you could, um, but I think there is a difference, right? W with a with a Snap. The, the data is kind of baked in and it's a it's a not as much of an industry standard as, as Docker is. Oh, and with Docker, you have the data external of the image. And so you could blow away the container, but the data remains. And also there is an official NextCloud Docker image with decent documentation that talks about volumes right from the get-go. Whereas a Snap is this kind of... And I, I'm really reluctant to, to, to bash on Snaps so hard, but... They're just a black box, and I've had to help several people extract data from Snaps that got things up and running that they didn't really understand what was going on under the hood, which is great. And I think in terms of enabling people to to do stuff that they wouldn't otherwise do is, is a good thing. But the flip side of that is that you don't necessarily plan well enough to, uh, you know, a, a data storage strategy, which volume is going to go explicitly where, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and with Docker Compose, you kind of have this reference guide you can go back to to see how you built things and where you specified the that the data volume was. Um, and if you build a snap and you create the YAML file that does all that, you would have that, those same insights. Uh, but it's just a different workflow. He goes on to ask a question that I, I think maybe we could we could kind of help him with here. He says, do you guys have any tips or resources to learn about this stuff as a home user level? I am no sysadmin. He doesn't do it for his day job. And uh, he doesn't have a lot of database and container experience. A lot of it goes over his head. He's wondering if we have any tips to migrate his Snap Next Cloud to a proper database. And I kind of felt like the solution here would be to keep it simple and start fresh with a Next Cloud container that uses an internal SQLite database and manually migrate your data over. Because a lot of the, like, if you think about it, the CalDev stuff, um, the, the iCal stuff, all of that will just export just fine. If you can do that, just export it, set it up fresh in the container, and then when you're ready, move to a, to a separate database as a separate project. Another option is to install an XCal client on a system, sync, sync down all your data, sign out of server A, the snap server, and then sign into server B and point server B at that directory, and it will just re-upload the stuff to the new instance. Yeah, absolutely. And the NextCloud CLI uh, client is 
the trick that I've used before to move next cloud server. So that is a good way to go. And that's not bad, Jeff. And I don't, I don't think you need to solve it all in one go either. Uh, if you're talking 10 users or less, you may find that the SQL light performance is perfectly adequate, especially because he talks in here about maybe using a Linode credit to build something and, and maybe set it up there. That instance is probably going to be so much faster than your HTPC that you'll never run into performance issues with the SQLite database. It's super handy to have a uh, a NetCloud instance running in the cloud on a Linode or something like that because it it means if your power goes out at your house, it's still up. If you don't want to punch holes in your firewall, it, it's available nice and easily outside. The downside of that is it means it's outside your firewall, which means that people might be, you know, port scanning you and bashing on it and, and trying to break into it. So Linode has this kind of firewall feature where you can disable and enable certain ports and stuff like that, you know, like you would in your home firewall. Um, so I'd recommend using that if you're going to put it in Linode just to lock down the attack surface as much as possible. And then also consider from a data strategy standpoint now, now you have your home system and you'll have an offsite system and now you can sync between them. So you could you could back up your Nextcloud Linode instance locally to your HTPC. And if you have some really valuable stuff on that HTPC like configs or whatever, you could now back that up offsite to Linode. So there's some data security advantages you could now also employ. So that's a, probably not a bad way to go. Speaking of self-hosting, do you want to take our next email? Dugit code is am I I'm I'm butchering that. Do you guys go? No, let's go with it. <laughs> Do guy code writes in. I was listening to episode thirty one, and I want to disagree whilst still agreeing with your opinion on the difficulty of self hosting an email server. Uh, too long didn't read. You can still partially hybrid self-host your emails and gain benefit. Emails a wonderful stack of tech that's often built with the Unix mindset of do one thing and do it well. And this is why I often encourage people to at least self-host a receiving email server whilst farming out the sending portion to an SMTP relay like Mailgun or Amazon's SES. You know, this is why I actually did contact MailRoute and I said, you guys should become sponsors of our shows. Because I really believe this setup is actually solid. And every time we fail to mention it, I think about it after the show. Because if I was going to host my email, and I've been thinking about it sometimes, I would do it exactly like this. I would have MailRoute, sponsor our show, guys, right in front of my email server. And that would do all of the nitty-gritty sending and receiving and the spam checking and all of that. It would be up when my home system is down. It could do a queue. It would deal with all of the domain blacklist issues. And, of course, they're a known good provider at this point because they've been around forever. So if I were going to build email today, I would set up a LAN server that only receives email from the mail route service. It doesn't receive email, and the LAN. It could receive email from the LAN. You've got to wonder how long it is before Google cancelled Gmail, don't you? No, never. Never going to happen from an advertising perspective. I, I know that, but... No, you know what You know what I've been thinking about Gmail? It's really about, it's about the mining. Because you, who doesn't have their receipt sent to their Gmail account? Everything you purchase that, even if it's not through a, a Google Pay app or anything like that, if your email goes to your inbox, Google knows what you've been buying. <laughs> That's so valuable. There's no way they'll ever turn that off. It's true. I'll tell you what, my mother-in-law's computer broke last week and I, I reconstructed what computer I built for her four years ago through my Gmail inbox. So it's useful. Yeah. So uh, I, I really like this hybrid email approach and I actually feel like maybe I may start adjusting my future answer about self-hosting email is do it, but just don't don't be responsible for directly sending and receiving email. And I I can't believe I didn't think of saying this the last couple of times this has come up on the show because this is how I have built it for my clients in the past. This is just it's it's how I would it's it's how I would do it. And if you're willing to self-host your email, then you need to consider a good intermediary. There's mail routes, one of them. There's other of there's like uh, Postini used to be one, but Google bought them. There's these that these intermediary services that become trusted, well-established players in the email ecosystem, and they provide the sending and receiving. They provide the queuing, and it's it's wonderful. That's why they should sponsor because you could you could very successfully set up a system like he's talking about. At the end of the day, though, you still have users that are relying on a service that 
really becomes integrated with their life. You know, when they're emailing attorneys or they're emailing people at their church or they're figuring out stuff for their kid's school, it's all happening on email. So even if it's just a few family members, when you start hosting their email, you you really discover how much email matters when it goes out. And that's a responsibility that you really have to take seriously. Yeah, it's a bit more serious than uh, I can't watch Plex. Yeah, or even a chat system being down, right? Because you can still pick up the phone and call. But the thing about email is it is a box of expectations and people can just drop an expectation in there. And so you can have people outside of your world that are sending an expectation into that inbox. And if your email is down and you didn't receive it, they still expected you that you got it and that you're going to be taking action on it. And it has domino effects. Very true. And now Brian writes in saying, hey guys, I've been using Home Assistant for about a year now, and I really enjoy the Home Assistant segments on the show. I've heard you mention MQTT a few times and was wondering if you could tell me more about it and its benefits with Home Assistant. So Chris, do you use MQTT for anything? No, and that's why I really like this question from Brian, because uh, I have like a Home Assistant FOMO a little bit, but I'm well, I mean, I'm almost Two years into using Home Assistant now, I can't keep track anymore. I've never actually had the need. I've gotten close to setting it up, but I've never pulled the trigger. So I I know you use it quite extensively, so I thought maybe you could kind of explain it to us since I'm obviously not as hands-on experienced. I understand in the abstract, but I'd like to hear from you. I use MQTT for my Tasmota devices. However, more recently, I found that it's becoming less and less necessary in the Home Assistant world, simply because the native Home Assistant API integration is becoming that much more mature. So, if uh, you know, a couple of years ago, when I gave that first talk at Linux Fest Northwest about Home Assistant and MQTT and that kind of thing, there weren't as many native Home Assistant API integrations, and so it was a, it was a lot more necessary back then. And so the thing that I use it for the most is for, I think, my Tasmota smart plugs. Whenever they are doing something, uh, they publish, you know, their, the amount of current going through the plug, their current state, you know, the, the last time they were rebooted. All of these things get sent to specific topics as messages. What other MQTT clients can do, of which Home Assistant is one of them, is they can subscribe to those topics and react when certain types of messages come in. So think of it rather than, you know, like the infrared remote kind of model where you you blast out information in the hopes that somebody's going to be receiving it. MQTT is doing the blasting of information, but it's also able to contextually figure out whether that message was received when it gets a certain response on a different topic. So you could have different states of things being received like a garage door, it could say garage door is currently open by publishing to a specific topic, a certain message, that kind of thing. So it's it's useful when your IoT devices need a two-way kind of contextual awareness of each other. And I think the other nice aspect of it is it's essentially as lightweight as it gets. And it's not necessarily dependent to run over TCP, but it most commonly does. And that that subscribe model means that a low powered device could only subscribe to the things that the topics that it absolutely needs to. And so it doesn't have to maybe check in as often and run the CPU as much, which saves battery life. Yeah. And and a nice example would be something in the connected world where like my car tells my house to open my garage door and start my coffee maker or something like that. That's that series of events needs to send a bunch of messages across a various different number of APIs. And and the idea behind MQTT was to unify those APIs behind uh, what's called a broker. So each of those devices, the car would publish a message to the broker under a specific topic, and then another device would be subscribed to that topic and, and react based on that message. And the nice thing is, is the car doesn't have to remain online because the broker holds the message, right? Correct. Yep. Mm-hmm. Also another way to save battery life. It's nice if you have some LEDs, for example, and you want to know what color they are. You know, Home Assistant and other, you know, um, smart lighting systems are only as smart as the last message they receive. Because these um, devices are publishing to the topic all the time, they can say, my current RGB value is this. 
So Home Assistant, without having to constantly poll the device, is also aware of what's happening on that device just by listening. But like you were saying at the beginning, with the amount of integrations that are available now, and a lot of the devices you buy today, you can buy with Home Assistant integration in mind. I actually haven't been compelled to set this up yet, but I I imagine there will be a future, some device, something I want to do that just simply works better using MQTT. Uh, maybe it's maybe it's a Tasmoda plug, maybe it's uh, a Shelly, something like that I could see pushing me into using it. If you need it, you'll know. <laughs> Our next question is about DNS. Do you want to take this one? Yeah, and uh, this is kind of this is kind of a good tie-in because everything on a network always runs a lot better when your DNS is in good shape. Ben writes in and he, he says he listens religiously, but he says we mentioned in our last show about hosting our own DNS. I'm wondering what you run and why. So um, I generally will, I mentioned it briefly, I'll generally self-host DNS on any LAN that I run anywhere for performance reasons, mostly, because local DNS lookups that uh, happen over your LAN are faster than going out to your ISP or even all the way out to Google or OpenDNS. It's just a simpler, straighter shot. doesn't even have to go out through a router. So that's one reason is performance. The other aspect of that, of course, is is everything caches. That means that it has a lot of records. So if I go to a lot of the same places on on my machines, once one machine's gone there, I have those records locally, which also improves uh, performance. And um, additionally, I like to be able to resolve all of my uh, machines by name, if possible. So a lot of times I'll use whatever solution ties and integrates in with DHCP. So that way when the DHCP server issues a lease, it also then dynamically updates my DNS server with that new client's hostname. Not all DHCP and DNS systems do this, but if there's like a if there's an option in the LAN I'm using that's straightforward, I go that route. There's a lot of ways you can do this. Sometimes it's DNS mass. Sometimes it's just something built into a router. It sort of depends on the hardware and equipment you're using. I don't have any religious like devotion to bind or, <laughs> or anything like that. Alex, do you have a specific like DNS religion on your lands? I wouldn't go as far as a religion. I mean, I, I run OpenSense uh, and I've run PFSense for a long time. OpenSense uses Unbound as its built-in DNS server. But to complicate matters, I also run AdGuard Home, which does DNS level ad filtering across my entire network. So the way I handle this is my DHCP leases hand out the IP address of the VM that's running AdGuard Home AdGuard Home is then asked to forward any queries that it doesn't know the answer to to OpenSense, and then OpenSense forwards any queries it doesn't know the answer to to Cloudflare or Google or whoever. And the reason I have to do that is because I'm running OpenShift and Kubernetes clusters on my LAN, and I want to configure the DNS overrides in Unbound because they know because the the router has the the firewall has the knowledge of which IP address is belonging to which VM and MAC address and that kind of stuff. But I also want the ad blocking capabilities of AdGuard as well, because mobile browsing is just a dumpster fire without it. So uh, there's lots of different ways. There's no right or wrong way to skin this particular cat. I actually wrote a blog post on how to do this with um, Unbound and Pihole a little while ago, which I'll put a link to in the show notes. Yeah, and to directly answer your question, Ben, I at home am presently using Pihole and have been very happy with it. If you use it as your GHCP server, it also does that handy update of the dynamic DNS. Datadog.com slash self-hosted. Today's episode of Self-Hosted is sponsored by Datadog. They're the unified monitoring platform that gives you real-time observability and detailed insights into your Docker performance as well. Why not enhance your visibility into container orchestration with a live container view? And you can easily detect clusters that are consuming excessive resources, and you get an auto-generated map that shows you how everything connects together. Out of the box, Datadog collects critical metrics from each of your containers, so you get immediate visibility into aggregated and even disaggregated service-level traffic. This is beautiful insights when you're developing an application or when you need to troubleshoot something, and it all gets displayed elegantly. Try Datadog today by starting a free 14-day trial, and you'll receive a Datadog t-shirt after you create just one dashboard. You have to go to datadog.com slash self-hosted to get started and get that 14-day free trial. 
if you're a sysadmin or you're a developer, I think you're going to be really drawn to Datadog because it was created initially to solve that problem between communicating between sysadmins and developers. But now it's really grown over the years into quite the unified metrics platform. And just a couple of years ago, they rewrote their agent into Go that makes it really efficient and easy to get an agent running on a machine that needs it. So get started. Go to datadog.com slash self-hosted. Get that 14-day free trial and get a free t-shirt when you set up a dashboard. datadog.com slash self-hosted. We might as well call this episode Google Turning the Screw, hey? Yeah, really. Yeah, and Google Photos, this one hurts because I got sucked into Google Photos. I tried to divorce Google Photos, and then I was pulled right back in, and I was promised free storage forever. Well, don't you still get it? Because you got a Pixel, right? Does that only count if you take photos on the Pixel? Because that's probably the phone I use the least these days to take photos. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. Nothing really changes for me, though, Alex, because I paid for two terabytes of Google Drive storage. And in their email to me telling me that they're discontinuing the unlimited storage, they said, but by our estimations, you're going to have four years before you have to worry about it. And nothing's changing until June the 1st, 2021, it's worth saying. So Google Photos will end its free unlimited storage in 2021. And The Verge writes that you will have to start paying after you hit the 15 gigabyte cap. Google already counts original quality photo uploads against the storage cap. But by taking away unlimited backup for high quality photos and video, which by the way are horribly compressed. If you've ever gone back and looked at any of those high quality pictures, they are like YouTube bad compressed. They they can be really bad sometimes. Mm. But I, th I think they're taking away one of the service's single biggest selling points, honestly. There is one law that seems to be true on the internet is unlimited storage never lasts. Never lasts. How can it? It's not sustainable, is it? I mean, if you think about how much just a single 10 terabyte drive costs you or me, okay, we're not buying it anywhere near the scale Google are, so they're not paying what we're paying. But I've got three or four terabytes up in the cloud, and I expect that to be highly available, replicated across multiple regions. And I mean, that's all transparent to me, but they, these are the assumptions I'm making about what Google are doing on the back end with the storage. It's not just one disk that I have to pay for the lifespan of. And so there'll be some people that are using way, way, way more than that 15 gig. Some people will be using terabytes, video production studios, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I have I have a two terabyte Google disk myself just for that, you know, a little extra space on, you know, and I don't want to worry about it for a while. But seeing this news and just always kind of staying Google aware, you know, like you have to stay bear aware when you're in the woods. Well, when you're on the Internet, you have to you need to stay Google aware. And it has this issue coming up again has reminded me that I should probably start planning an exit strategy from Google Photos. Yeah, but you know, at some point in the future, you're going to want to just open a Photos app and type the word mountain and just get all the mountain machine learning pictures that they found. Or let's be real. I want to find pictures of Levi really quick. I mean, <laughs> come on. <laughs> He's a cute dog. <laughs> I think it would be quicker for you to find pictures that aren't of Levi, probably. <laughs> Fair play to you. Yes, yeah, very true. Uh, that's the holy grail of self-hosting photo managers is can you have search and object recognition that's competitive with Google Photos? That's something we've been asked with the from the audience. It's something we've asked ourselves. And it appears that a project called PhotoPrism is promising to deliver just that. Actual object recognition automatically tagged and then available via search in a web UI. Similar, but maybe even superior to the Google Photos web UI. And Alex, I know you had a chance to try it out. So it does machine learning based on the TensorFlow library. And uh, I don't know, it's it's fine. It's It's no Google Photos, but it's certainly promising. They have a demo available if people want to try it out. I'll see if I can't get that linked in the show notes, but it's demo.photoprism.org. And you could go get a sense of how usable this thing is. And it worked. You can search for a mountain and it will find all of the pictures of mountain. Or you can search for dog and it will find all of the pictures of dog. Does this, I assume, just sit on top of a directory that you've passed through in Docker Compose? Yeah, so th the first time you add a directory in through Docker Compose, you have to put it in a very specific place in order for PhotoPrism to pick it up. So uh, PhotoPrism expects it to be in slash PhotoPrism slash originals. And once it's given that path, so through, through a volume by in a container, you can obviously make that any host path on your 
Pi or whatever else is is running this. But you're going to need some horsepower. I've got a dual socket Xeon system running my server, and I've been importing my 50,000 images all morning, and it's now mid-afternoon. We're still going, and we're only about 20% of the way through. <laughs> wow. It's pegged every single CPU core. So my I have 16 CPU cores passed through to this VM. My load average is at 18. I thought it would be on the GPU to tell you the truth. This is going to take quite a while on the CPU. <laughs> I don't have a GPU in that system, so maybe that's the problem. Oh, okay, okay. Huh. So you throw a box with a lot of resources at it if you want to try out PhotoPrism. <laughs> But, you know, this is what you're paying Google Photos for, right? Or what you're paying the storage. You're not even having to pay for this aspect. But, you know, Google's doing something very similar. Of course, they're also collecting the data. What kind of appeals to me about PhotoPrism is it means, but in a good way, I go back to like the early aughts where I self-managed my photo library and I self-organized it in what's called a directory. <laughs> no. And and then I just then I just throw something on top of it that does the image recognition. and. I'll tell you why I'm kind of burned about the Google Photos pricing change. Google Photos came along and it was really good at the object recognition and the search. But Alex, it was not the only game in the town. I was paying for a commercial service where this small team of developers, who I knew them, so I was, I was comfortable with it, they had created a product that took your photos and created the search index for you. And they were put out of business by Google Photos because Google Photos was free and they could not charge $8 a month for what Google Photos did for free and they had to shut down and they weren't the only shop that had to do that. So Google came along and they dumped their Google Photos product on the market and then after they killed all of the competition, they're now charging for the storage after telling you you'd have a lifetime of storage. It's the Walmart effect, isn't it? And so that's why I think it is maybe worth a few steps back in features and functionality, like I don't think PhotoPrism is going to like automatically generate those movies for you and suggest a book for you like Google Photos does. But it will give you a UI that sits on top of a directory of photos and searches and tags them. And of course, your mileage will vary depending on you, what computational method you use and how many photos are involved. <laughs> nice thing is, is that we've got both options available to us. One is we pay for it with our privacy and you know, that, that kind of thing. And the other one is a completely free and open freedom respecting solution. So I really hope that this project continues to improve and I'm going to see if I can contribute to it because photos really is one of the biggest pieces of, of, uh, our digital lives. And, um, and it's about, you know, it's, it's about really capturing your memories. It's about capturing some of the most important moments of your life. So as life goes on, you, you, you value those photos even more, right? So they become more precious over time, not less. Very true. Yeah. So, you know, Alex, I could see a future blog post and then a segment on the show where you or I have combined a auto backup from our phone to the file server that then goes into photo prism that then also does a secure offsite backup. Like I could see a whole photo workflow future. Um, and so if anybody has any insights, if they're doing something like this, um, why not start collecting intel from the audience? Go to selfhoster.show slash contact. What's really interesting is I'm just watching the uh, the processes in HTOP running running around. Uh, photo Prism is, is multi-threaded and it's, it's taking up most of the space. But every so often I see Darktable CLI applying custom presets coming through. So I think it's using other open source software under the hood dark table to render the previews and stuff like that so it's i think that's pretty cool that is really cool that would be a combo i would use that's so awesome all right i think i'm going to try it out so the only reason i didn't try it before the show is docker sucks at packaging up for the latest linux distributions and so i'm in this no man's zone right now where docker hasn't been officially packaged for the distribution i'm using and it drives me crazy and it's actually making me want to switch to podman but that is a topic for another show <laughs> that's a hangover from several years ago when uh, docker changed their semantic versioning to be monthly based instead and then they decided oh we're going to create our own yum or apt repos and then we're going to maintain them, except for the fact that new distros come out every six months, and then you need to create a whole new repo for that distro. And it's it's a perennial problem with Ubuntu and Fedora that uh, yes, they just don't solve, and it really annoys me. 
and I thought, you know, I could I could use the the distributions packages, but I don't really like doing that. Um, I could sw- I could try switching to Podman, but I decided, you know what? I'm just I'm just gonna wait. I'll just wait. You know, Chris, have you uh, have you have you heard of this thing called uh, Arch? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Alex runs Arch. <laughs> it's just not a problem on Arch, you know. <laughs> no, I, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. The funny thing is, is I I'm using the distribution of your employer, and you're using some hippie distribution because <laughs> I'm on Fedora 33. Hey now, hey now. My server's Ubuntu. My desktop is Arch. Yep. My laptop is Fedora. So. I don't care. You're not only a multi-distro guy, you're a multi-OS guy. You you really hold no platform allegiances. You just use what's best, and that's what I like about you. I, I try to. Uh, I want to mention our sponsor, a Cloud Guru, has a Python 3 scripting course for system administrators. If you need to develop some skills to write effective and powerful Python scripts, a Cloud Guru has a course that will have you completely covered. And beyond just the language itself, you'll go through full development processes, including project setup, planning, and automated testing to build different command line tools, all with Python 3. So go check out a Cloud Guru for that. We have a link in the show notes if you want to go directly to this Python 3 scripting for system administrator courses. I think you're going to like it. So we'll have a link in the show notes over at a Cloud Guru. It's Python 3 scripting for system administrators. Definitely worth checking out if you're getting in the Python game. Also, I want to mention our members, selfhosted.show slash SRE. That is... Our site reliability engineers that support the show and keep us on the air, you get a limited ad feed. So it's just the limited ads, just the ones we're contractually obligated to include. But you also get extra content. You get the post show. And uh, it's a great way to support the show, selfhosted.show slash SRE. I think we're going to be talking about your new smoker this week, aren't we? Oh, are we? Okay. I'm totally down. And it, it actually has a self-hosted component to it as well. So Ooh. that's perfect. Yeah, very good. Well, uh, we've mentioned it earlier in the show, but it's worth mentioning again. There is a way to get get a hold of the of this here uh, humble podcast. Selfhosted.show slash contact is the place to go to get in touch with us. And you can find me on Twitter at Ironic Badger. Yeah, I'm there too, at Chris LAS. And the show is at Self-Hosted Show. Thanks for listening, everyone. That was selfhosted.show slash 32.